Hello, Booktube. It's me, Randy Ray, the literate Texan, and I'm doing a buddy read with Steve Donahue about the uh, Star Trek novels of Sandra Marshak and Myrna Culbreth. And I don't know why I have to always look at those names, but I have to look at them every single time I make one of these videos. I've got the cover of the latest one. This was their fourth and final novel in Star Trek. They wrote two novels when they... Uh, Bantam Book held the rights to Star Trek, and then they wrote two novels for Pocket Books. And this is what the cover looks like. Um, you can see Spock and Kirk and the Enterprise on the cover. It's really nice. Uh, this was number nine in the series of Pocket Books, which lasted for, for quite a while. At one time, I believe it was in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, or I guess this would have been published even before that. It, it was obviously set before Wrath of Khan. But Star Trek Triangle is, uh, is, a, is an interesting novel, as all of the Marshak Carl Breath novels are. But uh, So this, this buddy read was Steve's idea, by the way. For Book Trek 23, this is my review of Star Trek Triangle, which... Okay, so after reading their other three novels, The Price of the Phoenix, The Fate of the Phoenix, and, oh heck, The Prometheus Design, which I loved, by the way, I've begun to realize that I can enjoy these Star Trek novels a lot more if I come at them from the perspective that they're set in an alternate Star Trek universe similar to, to, to what they call New Trek or, or Abrams Trek. Um, this is... You know, a, a Star Trek universe that's very similar to what we've screen, seen on screen before, but with some pretty interesting differences. One of the big differences is that uh, Kirk and Spock's relationship is a lot more intense than anything we've seen on the screen. The implication that they're lovers in some way is is pretty uh, pretty intense. Also, Spock's characterization in these books is is very different from his characterization in. Uh, the TV show or the movies. They seem obsessed with making him out to be this incredible Superman. They also have a real fondness for this telepathic link thing that, that Kirk and Spock have going, which I never saw in the series to speak of, but they're really fascinated by this sort of thing. Uh, they're also fascinated by these kind of larger than life villains, which is great. You know, uh, I don't think any of them compare with Khan and Singh, but they're still pretty cool. And they also have a lot of really pulpy action, as well as pages and pages of arguing over, Kirk, I'm going to die for you, Spock. And Spock's saying, no, I'll die for you, Kirk, um, which, which seems to come up in every novel. So, But, you know, I have a few notes here that I took. One of the things that I noticed about this novel in particular was that they referenced the New Humans, capitals, New Humans, which described a specific type of human that Gene Roddenberry wrote about in his own novelization of the motion picture. And I haven't really seen them referenced anywhere else, although I certainly haven't read all the Star Trek novels either. But I think it was a concept that was kind of left behind. But uh, also, so, so the storyline's kind of straightforward at first anyway. The Enterprise gets an assignment to take Ambassador Galbraith to a planet called Zarin. And uh, Ambassador Galbraith represents a, uh, a new type of collective among humans called the Oneness. And they sound an awful lot like Psychic Borg to me. You know, they're all in a collective. They all share a group mind. But there's not any of this uh, mechanical zombie kind of stuff. But, but they lose their individuality, which is exactly the opposite of, of what Captain Kirk tries to do. Uh, because Captain Kirk is all about individuality. But as it turns out, Zarin is this planet where ships get lost all the time. There is a competing collective on Zarin called the Totality. Okay? So you've got... And you, you see the word collective used throughout the novel. These are definitely precursors to the Borg. But it is an interesting plot line that you have these kind of psychic Borg uh, characters and joining this particular collective psychically is described as a kind of heaven for these people. So, uh, but 
you know, the, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think. Oh, oh, this is something else, okay? So they're also told, this is another concept that they're throwing in this book that I've never seen on screen before or in any of the other books, is the concept of the Federation free agent, okay? The free agent of the Federation is kind of like a Starfleet admiral, but he only answers to the top level chief of staff of Starfleet. You know, he doesn't answer to anybody below that level. And so this person automatically outranks Captain Kirk and, you know, but, and, and they're apparently very rare. This is another trope that you see pretty often in these uh, particular series of novels, because in the last novel, they had a character who was uh, Admiral Savage or Savage, I guess you could pronounce it that way, but it was pretty clear these guys love Doc Savage, but Admiral Savage had, had done everything and, and automatically, he was just this legendary Vulcan character, but, but the similarities between him and Ambassador uh, Galbraith are, aren't too different. But uh, Ambassador Galbraith also has a counterpart in the totality, and that counterpartner's name is uh, something Russian, Soljanev or something like that. But the free agent that they pick up, okay, falls in love with both Kirk and Spock at the same time. Spock and Kirk also fall in love with her at the same time. So now you've got this love triangle. And it's a really weird love triangle because, of course, in between the lines, but less so than the other three novels, you know, is the idea that Kirk and Spock's friendship is way more than just a typical heterosexual male friendship. But they spend the novel with this free agent. Her name is, uh, oh, she's got a great name. Sola Thane is the name of the Federation free agent. But... Spock and Kirk spend the novel trying to give this woman to the other one. Neither one of them want to take her on. She triggers Pon Far and Spock, and so, uh, you know, she has to mate with him, so to speak, and uh, to, to, to help him out and stuff. And, of course, Kirk's like, well, this may be Spock's only chance at love, but, you know, Kirk... And all of this happens instantly. They fall in love with her immediately, and Kirk is said to be just as in love with her as he was with Edith Keeler. So, so that was some interesting stuff. Um, the other thing is on this planet, this was pretty cool. It was almost like they're visiting some kind of lost world in space. And, and I love their descriptions of the various opponents that they face when they get to this planet because they have cat bears. That's a hyphenated thing, which are really, really big. Werewolves. And I don't know how they're werewolves uh, because, you know, there's no transformations. They don't go into a lot of detail about the werewolves other than to fight them. And there's also this giant python that they get to deal with, which they call a tree dragon. So this is really weird, wacky, far out stuff on this jungle planet with an active volcano, which is where the climax of the novel is set. Um, Spock acts like Spock in the other novels. You know, he's constantly fighting the, the rage and anger and emotions that he's inherited from his distant ancestors, which, you know, I guess is part of the character, but I don't think it's such a... I mean, for the most part, he's dealt with that in, in all the TV series and the books, other than these these Marshak Culberth ones. Uh, McCoy's got a bigger role to play in this one, which is nice. You know, uh, they, they seem to have gotten better at writing these novels as they went along. But it was nice to see McCoy have a larger role. And he's definitely the same McCoy that we see in the book, in, in, in the TV series, in the movies. Um, but also, Kirk, you know, it's gotten a little old watching Kirk kind of play the, the damsel in distress who's always having to be rescued either by the, the, the main female character in the book or Spock. Uh, this one also has some themes about deals with the devil. You know, uh, they're constantly testing the individualism uh, of Kirk and Spock. Um, yeah, so the climax is set in a volcano, which is a very pulpy thing to do. There's a lot of arguing back and forth. And I don't know why, but about halfway through the novel, every chapter starts ending instead of a sentence with a period, a sentence with an ellipsis, which I thought was really, really bizarre. So, uh, so anyway, here's the cover again, which I think if I tilt this, you can see pretty well, this is my Kindle Fire. 
I thought it was a lovely cover. And then I've also marked some notes in here for some passages that I wanted to read. Or I thought I did anyway. Let's see here. Maybe I didn't. Dang it, the description of one of the characters in here, though, was just, it was just so clearly patterned after Doc Savage that it wasn't even funny. I mean, it was, it was really, really serious stuff. Okay, well, I'm just still trying to work this. Go to location, flashcards. I knew there used to be, I highlighted a bunch of stuff in here, but I don't see how you get to the highlights. You know, I'm just kind of relearning how to work this Kindle. So uh, I really wanted to read some of this stuff out here. Let me see if I can find it. But it was, oh gosh, and there's no way that I was paying attention enough to this book. Soljanov, Soljanov was the guy. So, okay, so did it even save my highlights? Because I'm not seeing them here anyway. Oh, here's one. Okay. So, at some point, they decide, they start thinking about the, the kind of relationship that they're going to have as being, you know, a throuple. The, the free agent, Solothane, Spock, and Kirk. And so, I'm, I highlighted this. Spock may, might be quite right that their threeness was their best weapon. Or, it might be their most serious danger. More than likely, it was both. So the purple writing is still there from the other three books, but it's not quite as bad as it was. You know, they toned it down. They must have been working with an editor or something who had told them, you know, hey, you might want to turn this sort of thing down just a little bit. But uh, but I probably enjoyed this quite a bit. Okay, so here's another one that I marked. Logic Spock. If we dance to the tune the totality called, if I bond with her, or even if you did, they would control her. Spock, is there some possible salvation in the fact that we three are three? So I like that passage. I thought that was kind of cool. Definitely demonstrative about how these co-authors think about things. And, you know, different co-authors work in different ways, too. And when I noticed the ellipses showing up in the second half of the book, I started wondering, did one author write the first half of the book and the other author, author finish the, the second half of the book? I understand that's how the Destroyer novels were written. And those are also published novels, too. Um, okay, here's a line from Spock's dialogue that's completely uncharacteristic of him. Um, get out of here, Spock snarled. Well, first of all, I'm not a big fan of using words like snarled for dialogue to begin with. Said usually works just fine. But also, when have you ever heard Spock say anything in any of the TV shows or the movies where he said it with a snarl. That's just so out of character for, you know, that's why these have got to be set in an alternate universe where things are just different, you know? So, golly, the passage I wanted to read was about Soljanov because they basically described Doc Savage. I mean, it's if you know anything about Doc Savage, you know, here we go. As if on cue, the turbo lift doors, thanks for being patient with me. The turbo lift doors opened on the heels of Galbraith's words and Kirk looked up to find an alien presence on the bridge. The lone man who stood there might have commanded a galaxy and it was quite possible now that he would. He had been designed for command by some genius genetic sculptor of long ago who had managed to be both selective and lucky. The tall, massive, broad-shouldered body was a portrait in power. The coppery, gold-flecked eyes were hypnotic. The man's face and body were the essence of maleness, of maleness raised to the point of superdominance, as if that sculptor had carved a face and a stance to represent the essence of the conqueror or of the unconquerable. The man looked as if he had been cast in bronze with gold highlights in the eyes and a copper bronze mass of untamed hair. If that's not straight out of a Doc Savage novel, I don't know what is. I've never read about a character with gold flecks in their eyes other than Doc Savage. But I think that's cool, man. That just kind of added to my enjoyment of the book. So, you know, um, I recommend this book if you want to read some pulpy Star Trek fiction that's a little different from what you're used to. They did write, or at least edit, a couple of short story collections 
called The Strange New Worlds, uh, which has no relation to the show because these were years and years ago. These were from Bantam Books, and Steve promised me we could buddy read those too. So I've got them, but it'll be next week before I'm able to read them. So, but, but I'll have videos up for them uh, too. And then we will be finished with that aspect of Book Trek 23. But that's my review of Star Trek Triangle, number nine in the Pocket Book series. And this has been part of the Book Trek 2023 event, which happens June, July, August of this year. And all you have to do to participate is read some Star Trek novels. There's no complicated guidelines to it than that. So uh, I'll include links to the co-hosts or the bridge crew for the event, which was originated by Vin at Revenue Reads. And I'll be back with more videos very soon.